Good afternoon to everybody who's joined us. And again, a warm welcome to um, the many alumni who are with us today in the audience and other friends of the Africa Center. Um, thank you for joining us today for our webinar, Arms Trafficking and Border Governance Responses to Countering It in Africa. My name is Dr. Catherine Lena Kelly. I'm the Associate Dean and the Associate Professor of Justice and Rule of Law here at the Africa Center. And I'm pleased to be opening this webinar, which is the third in our series on border governance approaches to countering transnational organized crime. For a minute, let me just um, remind you what this series has been about. We've had about three webinars. This is our fourth in the series. And it's centered around questions of transnational organized crime and the African Union strategy for a better integrated border governance um, established in 2020. And that strategy has significant implications for countering and preventing transnational organized crime, which we've been exploring criminal market by criminal market over the past few webinars in this series. Um, so we've talked about natural resource related organized crime, the organized criminal elements of cattle wrestling, and we've also spoken about human trafficking and human smuggling dynamics. So uh, today we'll focus on arms trafficking and border spaces can be strategic areas for criminal networks that are involved in activities like these uh, to exploit. But there are also places where the security sector, along with other state and societal actors, can collectively address security challenges that arise from illicit economic activity. So in these webinars in the series, the intent is to provide insight into multi-sectoral responses that security sector leaders are part of uh, creating and mounting um, to build community resilience to transnational organized crime related challenges. Um, so um, we are looking specifically to think through with you um, in the audience, how the security sector fits into integrated border governance responses to these issues. Um, and in particular, there are five pillars of this African Union strategy that are always being considered um, implicitly in our discussions. Development of capabilities for border governance, conflict prevention and transnational threat countering, mobility, uh, migration and trade facilitation is another pillar of the strategy. The fourth is cooperative border management and the fifth is borderland community engagement. So that's a bit about the webinar series. More information can be found on our work on this um, on the Africa Center's website under the programs tab. Um, and before we introduce further information about our speakers and panelists today, let me um, uh, turn it over to our director, Ms. Amanda Dory, just to say a few words of hello and to introduce you to the latest about the Africa Center. A uh, good day, bonjour, bon dia, assalamu alaikum, siku and zori, dumela, sani banani. I think I've covered part of the waterfront, but it's difficult with so many languages. But let me say more simply, uh, happy new year, as this is our first webinar in 2023. Uh, you've heard it's the it, in the middle of a series that Dr. Kelly is leading, but it's our first one. So we're starting off with a great sense of optimism for this new year. It's a pleasure to greet you from the Africa Center for Strategic Studies here on the campus of the National Defense University in Washington, D.C. We're really delighted to be joined by an outstanding panel today to discuss arms trafficking and border governance with participation from Africa Center alumni from all over the continent. In terms of the RSVPs, I believe we have every country represented today on the continent and, and then beyond. My name is Amanda Dory, and it's my honor to serve as the Africa Center Director. As all of you know, the Africa Center was chartered by the US Congress more than 20 years ago, and we have been conducting academic programs and research related to security challenges in Africa ever since. The vision that we're working towards is one of citizen security. And by that, we're referring to security for all Africans championed by effective institutions that are accountable to citizens. Our program today is conducted in support of the vision and with respect to our methodology of dialogue and peer learning and seeking to catalyze strategic solutions. Before I turn you back to the program, just a brief reminder that our website contains all of our research to date, www.africacenter.org. 
And in particular, I'd like to mention a new offering that results from an event that we hosted during the US Africa Leaders Summit, an executive dialogue that focused on military professionalism and professional military education. We had an excellent roundtable discussion and the results of that are, are summarized in a piece available on our website. So please uh, check that out, uh, check the other offerings out if, if you have a moment. And with that, let me turn it back over to Dr. Kat Kelly for our program today. Thank you. So let me introduce the panelists. Um, we're still having a technical difficulty with Dr. Mubiala, but I'm going to introduce him, uh, being optimistic that we get him online here soon to join the conversation. And Captain Gillespie, if you could turn on your camera, um, I'll introduce you as well. Um, so we have with us uh, first uh, uh, Navy Captain Dean Gillespie, retired. He's a former South African senior naval officer with 36 years of law, conflict resolution, mediation, military operational, peacekeeping, and arms control experience. He has 25 years of service in the South African Department of Defense, where he served in the Marines, and then at various naval bases and on ships as an intelligence officer, transferring to the Judge Advocate General thereafter. He's also been deployed to support the UN, as a senior staff officer in Burundi and Democratic Republic Congo. In 2012, Dean took early retirement from the Navy. Uh, he joined the UN as a professional senior judicial advisor for UNMIS, the UN mission in South Sudan. Um, he's worked on military justice, rule of law and security institutions and a variety of other issues. He's also been an arms expert on the panel of experts of the UN Secretary General, among many other achievements and awards. Um, he's now uh, founder um, and runs Crino International Consultancy Group. And then uh, the other person who will be joining us soon, uh, again, I, I, I'm optimistic, um, Dr. Mutoy Mubiela is a professor of international law uh, at the University of Kinshasa in Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, he has published over five books and over 160 articles on various aspects of international law, and he spent a long and illustrious career in the UN as well, first at the UN, UN Institute for Training and Research, and then as a staff member on the Office of the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights. Um, he's held various positions of responsibility therein, and he contributed to the establishment of the UN Center for Human Rights and Democracy, in Central Africa, based in Yaoundé, and he was the first manager of that um, back in the 2000s. Um, so he's contributed to a variety of trainings in international law and should also have some really interesting insights um, on uh, the topic today. And I think I see him joining right now. Um, so I think he'll be joining us soon. Luckily, I want to kick off the conversation first with Captain Gillespie. Um, so let me begin by posing you the first question while Dr. Mubiela gets settled. Uh, Captain, could you please spend a few minutes speaking to the magnitude and the empirical trends related to arms trafficking in Africa that you've recently observed in your work? So in other words, who are the key criminal actors here engaged in the trafficking? What are their motivations? And what do flows look like? I know you have lots of experience from Horn of Africa, Southern Africa that you can bring to bear here. But if you could limit yourself to about seven minutes to get us started, then we'll continue the discussion. Thanks very much, Kat, and thank you for having me. Seven minutes to explain all the usual suspects uh, in terms of illicit arms deals and uh, arms trafficking in Africa uh, is a tall order. I want to write a book on it one day, um, but let's start at the beginning. Um, ladies and gentlemen, as you know, the Hollywood notion of a, a Lord of War arms dealer as characterized by Nicolas Cage is not the reality. The reality in an arms dealing in Africa is that the arms dealing in Africa is dealt with um, by the usual suspects of criminal syndicates, smugglers, and complicit state, uh, state um, uh, holders, um, and, and particularly countries which are subject to UN or other international embargoes regarding arms weapons, arms and weapons. What is characterized in Africa too is if you look at the formal sector of arms sale, um, which amounts to about $212 billion, with America selling 41% of those arms 
most of the arms that are sold by the Americans, followed by the Germans and the French um, uh, and the Chinese, Russians, so are generally speaking missiles, aircraft, ships, big stuff, big heavy equipment. In Africa, the trend is more to small arms and light weaponry. Um, so in Africa, what we have is a situation, and if you want to use South Sudan as a case study, South Sudan has been going through some trials and tribulations for more than 60 years. Um, they have been at civil war, they've been fighting for the independence and the freedom, and then unfortunately in 2013, and around about the 15th of December 2013, um, South Sudan devolved into a civil war which was based on ethnic tensions and uh, that situation hasn't changed much. There is still very much uh, a back and forth with peace promises and peace treaties. Another fallout in 2016 which resulted in another small conflict um, and they have been subject to an arms embargo. Now if you look around South Sudan and I spent a lot of time in South Sudan traveling up and down there was evidence of new arms coming in, but they, they weren't new arms. They were surplus arms. So in other words, a 1956 uh, AK-47, uh, which looked brand spanking new and you knew it was straight out of the box and could not possibly have been um, one of the old stock in South Sudan and must definitely have been imported, but there's no ways you can tell because there's no way of registering the weapon. There was no way of following the weapon and it clearly was surplus stock. So from the strategic national level, you've got state um, uh, in complicity uh, in bringing in arms into Africa for whatever political or ethnic reason. And they work closely with the smugglers to bring in the arms um, in three ways, uh, by air, and generally speaking, we have a lot of air traffic with strategic lift capability flying from the surface stock that is available in Libya, through Egypt, through Sudan, to South Sudan, to Entebbe and beyond. Uh, and this is one of the favored ways of moving equipment. It's very expensive, obviously, but it is very discreet. It happens at night. There are no way of identifying the aircraft because all the identification of the aircraft is painted out. And of course, um, all transponders are switched off. So you have no idea where it's coming or going. The panels of experts for years and years tried to tr um, uh, record um, these aircraft coming and going. And we have a pretty good record of that. I myself sat on a container at Tom Ping in South Sudan and Juba and recorded many flights coming in at night, but it was impossible to tell because at night, the entire enterprise is covered by the military and it's all under the cover of darkness and there's no way you can tell. But you can see on your binoculars um, that, you, and with your camera equipment that they unload boxes and boxes get loaded into the vehicles and then they disappear to Bulsam, which was the local um, uh, divisional headquarters of the then SPLA, now it is the SSPS. So flight is one of the ways of getting in. And if you look at South Sudan, uh, there are quite a few airstrips in South Sudan, probably about two dozen really good airstrips where flights can come and go uh, under the radar and out of the eyes of the international community. The other way that arms are traveling down, and this was uh, exhibited this week on Monday, when the Navy craft interdicted a Dow coming down from the Gulf, uh, and the Dow was loaded with over 2,000 brand new AK-47s destined for Yemen from allegedly Iraq with ammunition. And uh, the favored way of moving um, illicit arms, drugs, uh, human trafficking is by sea, and unfortunately, those of you that are international lawyers will know that whilst cargo ships are subject to quite a lot of rules and regulations, uh, fishing vessels or trawlers and dows are not. A dow is basically stateless. There are thousands of them. They, they, they uh, travel ancient routes 
all the way up and down the east coast to Mozambique, making stop-offs, dropping off drugs, weapons, human trafficking, picking up different cargoes, all related to each other in an integrated way. I was saying to Dr. Kelly the other day that the criminal syndicates are way more sophisticated than um, most regional organizations when it comes to logistics, and they move huge amounts of weapons, drugs, human trafficking, teak, wood, uh, you know, um, teak sells for about $500 per cubic meter. And if you have a look at a place like the um, areas of uh, Eastern Equatoria, um, the local community may get $10,000 for a couple of thousand acres of teak to be removed. And that teak then gets quietly moved through Uganda to Kenya and beyond and will fetch the criminal syndicates anywhere between five and $10 million. Mm -hmm. So that's the same case for gold. Uh, the alluvial gold, which is in the in the uh, the Kapueta region, is the same, and it's moved through the border posts of of uh, of Neris, completely out of the eyes, no borderline control. It goes over in trucks, and uh, the gold is one way, and the weapons are the other way. Um, huh. This is a major problem. So we've got land, sea, and air, um, and very old smuggling routes. Um, for example, in 2019, uh, a reporter followed an ancient smuggling trail that led from Congo right through South Sudan and into Ethiopia and up to Syria, moving ivory, gold, human trafficking, and weapons back and forth. Um, and it's been around for hundreds of years, as is the, the navigational um, routes that travel down to Mozambique and where weapons and supplies are dropped off sure. in Nakala, in uh, Capa Delgado uh, for the extremists. Mm -hmm. So you have governments who are complicit, working very closely with smugglers. You have extremist organizations like what is happening now in Capa Delgado in, 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 uh, in Mozambique and where right now there's quite a lot of kinetic warfare going on in the region. Um, and then you also have, um, apart from the, uh, the embargoed countries, you also have communities, uh, particularly the nihilistic communities, um, and what is called by us as the end trade, who have traditionally many, many years ago, probably 40, 50 years ago, replaced the spear with the AK-47, and they will go out as a community, and they will purchase an AK-47 for their 12-year-old child to guard the cattle. Now, that doesn't sound like a really dangerous affair, but if you have a look at, for example, the Lone in uh, the Zhongle provinces of, um, of South Sudan, they, like the Zulus, have MPs for age six, which protect the community. And there is a, they call themselves the white soldiers, and essentially they're there for self-defense of the community. And uh, the United Nations Rick, uh, has done an estimation that there are up to 300,000 of the white army in South Sudan, all between the ages of 12 years and 20, all armed to the teeth uh -huh. with, uh, with weaponry. And if you have a look at that, that is also an aspect of the nihilistic societies in South Sudan, Sudan, partly Kenya, and other areas where uh, on a Friday night, for example, we've had reports of a community rustling up 10,000 of the community to go and rustle cattle from the next door neighbor tribe, uh, resulting in a considerable casualty. So that is the, the profile in Africa using small arms and weapons, which are mostly surplus weapons. Thanks. Um, it makes yeah. sense. Though. It makes sense that they use surplus weapons because if you're a general in one of the countries and you have a small budget, it's cheaper to go and buy surplus, which works just as well as the new weapon does, than to go out and try and purchase new weapons from the, from the marketplace. So that's the profile. Yeah. Um, and and that, those are the people that are involved. And in South Africa, particularly, uh, in, in Africa, particularly, the ubiquitous AK-47 is the weapon of choice. 
Uh, and um, estimations are that there are between 30 and 50 million pieces in Africa. Um, and having a look around, I think that's probably quite accurate. Well, thank you. That was a tour de force of, as you said, a lot of material that's very hard to cover in a short time, but you sort of took us through air, land, and sea, uh, state complicity, which I think we'll come back to um, in, in why we see these small arms and light weapons flows. Um, and then you've really covered how arms trafficking is a criminal market that overlaps and intersects very directly with the other sorts of criminal markets that we've been talking about in this series. So thank you, Captain Gillespie. Um, let me turn to Dr. Mubiala, who's joined us. Bonjour, Dr. Et je voudrais continuer notre I would like to ask you the second question. Uh, how does uh, the uh, traffic on a uh, judicial level uh, in a country like yours, in the Democratic Congo, uh, how can these treaties be used uh, to fight against these actors, uh, to protect uh, safety and security? Can you, in seven minutes, um, talk to us about the judicial judicial and national and international plan so that we understand better. Yes, thank you so much for giving me the floor, Catherine. Uh, thank you, uh, Captain Gillespie, uh, to uh, uh, give us the tour de force, and he was also talk, talking about my country, um, the DRC, that is illegal traffic um, is a reality. He was talking about uh, economic resources, but also natural resources. Uh, and this is the situation in my country, in Congo, uh, since 30 years, uh, the, since the years 1990. Uh, everything which um, had to do with Mobutu, then we had the crisis in Rwanda, uh, then we had other conflicts. Uh, regional conflicts between the uh, countries, uh, our neighboring countries, and then we had the army. So there is the illegal traffic of arms in the region. Unfortunately, the uh, judicial arsenal, uh, the legal arsenal that ex existing today is not uh, able to respond to this uh, level of illegal trafficking. For example, if we ask what is the law that internal law that covers this illegal traffic of arms, we have a law that dates from 1985 uh, that, uh, under the arms law on arms and ammunition, but, but um, it really does not um, deal with how to how to apprehend uh, pursue and apprehend uh, the um, smugglers but to, today we have a, a situation uh, where the country that where this law is obsolete it no longer functions for our current situation. And so we need a new law. There has been a bill uh, in place for almost 10 years that is uh, dragging through the legislative process currently. It's in the National Assembly and the Parliament. So we, so they are hoping to go further with this new law to prevent um, the illegal uh, trafficking and distribution of arms, of weapons. And it's going to be a much more complex law than the one that is currently in existence. Unfortunately, this uh, bill uh, has not yet been officially adopted into law and we are hoping to reinforce this bill with uh, uh, legal and instruments, uh, especially, for example, the Convention of Kinshasa for the uh, light weapons and uh, weapon, 
and that was adopted in Kinshasa and that is already in place. But uh, in, in the DRC, we have not yet completed this process because in, two, in December 2018, there were efforts to have people give up their arms. I went myself purposefully to see the levels and to see these, uh, to see if these these tools had been ratified. And then also, there's also the treaty on the um, arms trade that we are focusing on. So we're currently in a situation uh, where there is law, the laws in place are obsolete. They, we are trying to improve them and to bring them up to date. Um, and also um, there are the international treaties that we are seeking to adhere to. And this is what we are looking at in terms of the traffic of light arms uh, currently. Catherine, thank you so much. This is what we're doing in our fight against small arms. Yes, you do have in your response uh, highlighted a few themes that will continue to be um, the subject of our exchange here today, especially the interactions between uh, the the national level, the legal, the national judicial level, uh, by the um, RECs, the regional economic communities, and then also the processes of ratification and adoption of laws and the modification of laws in the context of a country. For example, uh, the example given was your country, the DRC, with the changes in your security context. Perhaps it will be possible also to modify the content of the legislation concerning these um, small arms. Thank you for your response. I'd like to turn back to Captain Gillespie now, if I can, and ask him a second question. Um, so Captain Gillespie, um, what role then, um, given these dynamics, do you think the security sector can play in enhancing rule of law related responses to arms trafficking, particularly in border communities, um, whether we're talking about coastal or landlocked um, areas? You know, what kinds of security and defense interventions uh, might work in the Horn of Africa, what are the limitations the security sector also has to working in this area? Again, questions that could be the subject of a whole thesis or a long conference, but you have about seven minutes. <laughs> Thank you very much. I've put myself on timer to make sure I do that seven minutes for you. I, you know, the reality is, is that there, the United Nations, the African Union and its regional partners have one thing in common. They like to have meetings and they like to talk. And they like to plan for meetings, to plan for committees for the future. And we don't ever seem to get there. There's lots of promises, great intentions, but uh, the results are poor. And the reality is in Africa, particularly, we have porous borders. There is very few countries in Africa that can really claim to be sovereign. They're not. They are city-states with law and order in the city-states. And as you go out into the, the regions, and I have spent a lot of time in deep field in most of African countries in one capacity or another, the borders are deeply porous. Um, and for a good reason. One of my bosses, um, President Mbeki, once said that in 25 years from now, when you look at a map of Africa, it will be completely different to the colonialist borders that have been defined. And this is a reality in Africa. In Europe and in other more developed places, you have the concept of strong borderline integrity. And it is a moot argument that those countries that have strong borderline integrity generally have strong economies and strong security. 
strong security is the is the basis to strong democracy and a strong economy. In Africa, it is very, very hard. Even in a, develop, a developing nation like Kenya that is doing so well economically, the moment you go up to Wajir on the border, you are back in the wild, wild west and the extremists are crossing over the border from, from Somalia and causing chaos. And it's the same with South Sudan. Um, you know, the, when the uh, South Sudanese, when, when it was decided that they were going to create a panel of experts to monitor the embargo in South Sudan, their initial assessment was it would be an easy job because there's only 11 access points into South Sudan. Now, for an African like ourselves, and I'm born Zambian, um, that was laughable because there are thousands of entry points into South Sudan. Uh, the Nile River is largely unregulated and a lot of, lot of stuff comes down from Sudan into South Sudan. The airports, the various uh, border points. The only border point that's been monitored properly in South Sudan is the Nimule border point, which is a very nice border point. I've been there, I've inspected it. It is very well run. The major problem is that the smugglers don't use the Nimule border post. They use uh, the Naras border point, which is 300 and 320 kilometers uh, on the, the east. And it actually doesn't go into Uganda, it goes straight into Kenya. And it is completely unregulated. And I know this because trucks from the WHO go over that border post every day in their hundreds. There's no stopping, there's no inspection, and uh, stuff comes and goes there without any any regulation whatsoever. So my answer to you is we need more resources. It is absolutely impossible to have one person in the panel of experts running arms and one person monitoring the finances and one person monitoring the natural resources of uh, a country and then hoping somehow that that one person is going to cover all these entry points. It is a mission impossible for these poor people. Um, and, and, and I take my hat off to them because they work really hard. They don't get any holidays. Um, and it's a thankless task because uh, it, it's like trying to determine what is in the sea by taking a bucket of water. It's not going to work. So my answer to you is an integrated approach rather than the myopic approach of having one group studying one country, you need a regional approach. You need to integrate the, the African Union and the, the, local, the local regional um, unions that govern the areas and then bring in an organization like Interpol and the United Nations Office of Drugs and Crime uh, and start developing a, a more overarching strategic approach, putting more resources in get the results. At this stage, nothing is going to help this scourge of illegal arms, uh, human trafficking and drugs until such time as people start putting their money where their mouths are. And, and until such time that is done, I'm very much afraid to say that the status quo is going to remain. And I did that in five minutes, 25 seconds. You did, that was very impressive. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, and you said a lot um, in terms of um, how we um, prioritize resources, how we need to take, um, given the um, cross-border nature of this, um, what does that mean for the monitoring regimes for arms flows? Um, what does that mean for um, how we pursue a form of border security um, nationally that's more integrated with perhaps some of the other sectors that need to collaborate on this? Um, so, yeah, very interesting points. Um, I would, uh -huh. I'd like to also add, you know, there is one area that has been working, and that is um, with the piracy that, uh, the, that was faced around the Somalia area, and we had um, Operation Atlas here with half the world's navies, a huge amount of resources put in place. Um, there is an old Navy saying that says you, there is no control without patrol. Uh -huh. And patrol at sea has been quite effective in stopping some of the doubts, not all of them, um, but it does 
illustrate that if you put the right resources in place in terms of putting law enforcement um, mechanisms, mechanisms and, and it could work on the border posts as well, air patrols and so on, uh -huh. there is a potential for success. Great. Well, yes, thank you for bringing in the maritime domain as well. I think frequently with organized crime, there are some interesting lessons that can be learned from um, how these issues are treated on the sea. Um, in addition to on land, that's another integrated um, area for further integration, I think, in terms of lessons learned. So thank you, um, Captain Gillespie, for pointing that out. Let me turn again to Dr. Mubiala. Uh, I'll ask my question to him in French. Dr. Mubiala, alors, uh, nous sommes en train de Dr. Mubiala, we have discussed that the uh, border spaces are often the targets of uh, political um, efforts to target illegal trafficking. So do you think the cooperation between security, the security sector and the uh, justice uh, sector what is the role that this cooperation can play in the fight against uh, the arms trafficking? And in terms of the uh, judicial sector, perhaps uh, uh, working with the community, cooperation in terms of the application of the laws. Uh, uh, um, I imagine that you have a few examples of a few aspects of this coordination that can help us. So the floor is yours. Yes, thank you so much, Catherine. I am going in the direction of, con I'm going to continue with what uh, Captain Gillespie was saying, that of the importance of having a regional approach in the fight in this kind of illicit trafficking. So uh, that we can look, see two levels. The first level, that seems uh, the most obvious is a lateral approach between states to have patrols between bordering states to uh, fight the illicit traffic of arms. As you know, our states are under equipped, the armies of our states are under equipped to do this. Most of the countries. Uh, also, sometimes the countries are, have uh, tensions and conflicts between them in the region of the Great Lakes. You have the three countries for now, uh, Uganda, Rwanda, um, and we have the cooperation uh, to uh, fight uh, the ADF in North Kivu. But you know, we don't have much bilateral cooperation. There are not many examples of patrols and we don't have many judicial agreements or extradition agreements on paper. And not much effort has been done in the region of the Great Lakes. Um, the International Conference on uh, the Great Lakes, CGL, developed a normative document, which is very important. Uh, there you have the protocol on judicial cooperation. It also includes laws which each region can adopt. For example, for the arrest or extradition of criminals. And also under criminals, uh, you have a the illegal arm traffickers. Unfortunately, these standards, these norms, which have been developed during this international conference on the Great Lakes were not domesticated on a local level. Uh, there was a talk about cooperation with Interpol when we had the grand conference on the Great Lakes uh, and also a we developed a network. It is a judicial network in the region of the Great Lakes. Uh, it is not only on a judicial aspect, but also on a security aspects. Uh, these are general proc uh, 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 attorney generals. Uh, there are uh, police forces. They 
come together on a regular basis where they exchange information on criminality in the region and where they develop uh, conditions on extradition and uh, arrestation together. Um, I had the luck to be able to be present in uh, Nairobi for the United Nations. When these talks took place, it was Mr. Saeed Jadid uh, who was present as well. And these networks work. Uh, we rotate uh, these meetings in the region. There are 12 uh, countries, Sudan, uh, South Sudan, Burundi, Rwanda, uh, Tanzania, Zambia, all the countries. Uh, we have a rotation of these meetings and all of these countries um, are part of this network. Uh, these networks come together. There is uh, the prosecutor, the general prosecutor, there are the police officers, uh, they get together and then they examine problems uh, which they have with the cooperation in uh, the border region. Meetings were held and these meetings and they dealt especially with um, they dealt with arms trafficking for example there was a meeting in south sudan where we examined the problem uh, with um it poaching it, the extinguished species we were asking the extradition of some well-known criminals and Germany Boulot, uh, the founder of ADF, um, he held talks in uh, Tanzania and Uganda. Unfortunately, the 12th meeting uh, could not happen. Um, we have not had this focus on the illicit arms trade. And this is so important that the member states the signatories come together uh, to work on this, to cooperate in the region of the Great Lakes. And we developed, uh, the African Union developed a roadmap uh, to stop this illicit arms trade in Africa and this would be so important for the Great Lakes, um, but we need to have a meeting specifically on uh, the uh, uh, small arms and light weapons trade. Thank you so much, uh, Doctor. You gave us a very interesting example. Uh, this network, this uh, judicial cooperation network in the region of the Great Lakes, but uh, they are not only the general procurers who are there uh, with the police officers who exchange information uh, on the different uh, criminalities, but they work with the different regional police forces as well. You also underscored the fact that you have not yet had a meeting, uh, a specific meeting, to talk about uh, the traffic in small arms and light weapons. It will be very interesting to have such a meeting and to see if in the future uh, this regional organization or maybe other organizations might underscore this topic because the consequences are so awful for security because of this illicit traffic. I have another question for you, doctor. It has to do with this exchange. You yourself did some research on the elaboration of protocols and policies on armed traffic with the ECOWAS, and also with the CDLC. Um, what can we learn for uh, the security se sector and for the judicial sector uh, to improve the situation? How can we use these protocols, these uh, 
national policies to counter the illicit traffic, especially to help the populations who live in these areas. In other uh, words, what is the role, according to your research, for uh, the uh, uh, economic regional communities? What is their role in this coordination? Thank you so much to have asked this question. Uh, as you uh, know, uh, the regional economic uh, organization is there uh, to deal with economic issues. Um, and uh, we have ECOWAS in West Africa, uh, and this is also uh, an organization which needs to be able to work when we are in conflict, when there is not enough uh, security and safety in Africa, in, and especially in the sub-region. Uh, we have this real big problem of uh, trafficking in small arms and light weapons. Um, you know, it's, you have easy access uh, to these uh, weapons. So ECOWAS uh, has some initiatives uh, to counter uh, this traffic and uh, to uh, have a moratorium on light weapons. There was a convention. It was the convention of ECOWAS on circulation uh, of uh, small arms and light weapons. And ECOWAS adopted this coordination program um, to be able to implement in the different states this convention. Because the implementation of a convention is only efficient if it is done on two levels. First of all, you have to operate on a national level, but also on a, the regional level. On the national level, you have to develop uh, the best practices um, according to uh, the ECOWAS system um, with regards to the small arms and light weapons. I remember that I worked a lot with the National Commission uh, in Mali. Uh, this was one of the most active regions in the days um, with regards to recuperation of small arms and light weapons because they had this war in the northern part uh, uh, in the country there were the terrorists and uh, you remember there was uh, President Konakri uh, at the time and uh, there were these weapons which were burned this was a symbolic um, a move in the days in Timbuktu, and I believe I was in Mali at that point in time. Uh, so you have uh, the national level with the national commission, and these national commissions are not bureaucratic structures. These are living structures. Uh, they work with the populations. In order to better suppress these weapons, you have to work together with the populations. Uh, the communities need to interact. They cannot uh, only be the victims. They need to know what's going on, uh, and they need to have a role to play. So it is very important, uh, and the aspect um, here of ECOWAS definitely included the community to fight against the small arms and light weapons traffic. And then uh, on the international level, uh, the verification uh, of the end user is important. You know, it is prohibited uh, to uh, pass weapons from one country to the next, um, even officially. Uh, however, there are waivers because there are the armies. Armies need to have these weapons. And so the ECOWAS countries, the member states, uh, they have a waiver if they need uh, weapons to be transported from one country to the next. Uh, these weapons are marked, and this is important. Uh, these weapons have certificates. Um, so you are able to check where the weapons uh, uh, go I and mean, who is the end consumer who buys uh, the weapons and this is important and uh, this ECOWAS system um, was also taken over by the CDSC um, it is the same type of a commission uh, which is implemented on the national level and which imposes the uh, Convention of Kinshasa uh, from 2010 on small arms and light weapons. And regional efforts were undertaken. You see, the difficulty uh, for the sub-regions is that the states adhere 
uh, to the these treaties, but unfortunately, if you adhere to one instrument uh, on an international level um, or and a regional level, then there is more talk about the universal um, a treaty or the international treaty. And I think that it is important to respect the two regimes because they uh, complement each other. You need to be able to work on these two levels. Um, it is important to uh, understand who the end consumer is, and in order to know this, um, these two systems need to be adopted and need to be implemented to uh, counter um, the illegal, illicit, universal sm uh, small arms and light weapons uh, trafficking situation. This is what I can to can contribute uh, to this subject. Thank you so much. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Mubiala. I found very interesting when you talked about your experiences in Mali, when you were working with the national commissions in the region, and also when you said that, you know, if uh, we could have uh, living structures and not bureaucratic structures, then there is much more space uh, to have a positive changes happen in the region. So you learned to this, and this is an interesting for us. So Captain Gillespie, one last question for you um, uh, to finish us off in the moderated discussion. So going up to the continental level, to the Pan-African sort of AU level here, what concrete steps do you think security and defense actors can take to facilitate uh, the implementation of AU policies and procedures? Things like the AU's framework for silencing the guns. We have a roadmap for that uh, that's been around for a while um, in practice. And um, there's also this strategy for a better integrated border governance that I described to our audience at the beginning of the webinar. So um, given that there's some AU frameworks or roadmaps on these things, what can security and defense actors do to further strengthen collective responses to countering arms trafficking? Excellent. Thank you, Doctor. Um, I, I think this is a natural carry on from what uh, Dr. Mubiala uh, was talking about. And I want to endorse everything that Dr. Mubiala said. It makes absolute sense and uh, it is the truth. So what we have now is we have Africa, a continent designed in colonialist times with fractious borders, porous borders, which split communities in half everywhere. It isn't a single African country that doesn't have one tribe of people on the one side of the border and another and the same tribe on the other side of the border, whether it's South Sudan, Mozambique, South Africa, Swaziland, there is an issue with the borders. So the obvious answer is from a strategic national level to have regional organizations working more closely together to deal with this, because you can't deal with it as one country. You have to deal with it as as a combined integrated approach. Um, so there is no question that the AU and the organs of ECOWAS, SADC and others are going to have to work together, preferably with funding from organizations like the United Nations and Interpol to police train in an integrated way. And I'll give you a lovely example that I saw in, in, in Kenya Interpol was busy training the KRA, the Customs Revenue Authority, um, on better ways to deal with customs and excise coming through with algorithms which can pick up problems on manifests and uh, when uh, uh, transport goes through a big x-ray machine, which is a big gantry, the algorithms can pick up for example, the spring of a magazine of an AK-47 and accurately identify. So you bring in international support like that, you can have a framework. And ECOWAS was more successful in West Africa than the East African context because you did have a little bit more political will. And it's really important to get that political will going. In the East Coast area, there is a lack of political will which means that countries like Tanzania, for example, are just a big question mark because we have no idea what goes in and out. Um, and yet there is a lot of smuggling going through Tanzania and there is no international eyes on it. 
but we do know that, for example, a lot of the gold that comes out of South Sudan ends up through Tanzania and into South Africa and is sold off as South African gold. Um, and that also then funds the illegal market towards arms and ammunition. And so from a strategic level, there definitely needs to be an integrated regional approach. On a tactical level, as pointed out by, by Dr. Mubiala, we have a problem with the technical aspects of the control, right down to management of stockpiles. There's no management of stockpiles in a lot of countries. So um, when weapons come in, they get distributed. There is no lists. There is no registration. There's no permits. You can't trace that weapon. And when that weapon moves on from one country to another, it's almost impossible to find out where it came from. Um, so it is really important that the African Union introduces a common registration system. It's not impossible. The technology is there. We also need management of stockpiles and destroying surplus and, uh, and obsolete weapons need to be done. Because what happens is that the surplus weapons just disappear. Uh, certain generals, and I'm not blaming countries now, there are individuals within the organizations that are corrupt. They pocket the money and this we these weapons then resurface somewhere else. And I'll give you a very pertinent example. The EUC, the End User Certificate, is not a standard document throughout the world. Every country adds its own little interpretation. They generally follow the same rules. Some countries have beautiful EOCs. Um, other countries have rather basic ones. South Africa's ones, for example, are terrible. Now, these EUCs are the documents you need to, 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 to justify the purchase of weapons. You can't purchase weapons without an EUC. You can't purchase weapons without a dealer's certificate. But then you also need an export permit and an import permit and a return of service. And in all that, you also have to undertake not to transfer these weapons once you've bought them. It goes down very nicely in theory, but in practice, what is happening, particularly in Africa, and there are quite a few countries that are practicing this corruption, you've got, for example, some countries that are offering fake EUCs and certificates for a percentage of the deal. And those pass muster because they are official documents. And whilst I'm not blaming the government for this, and it's, it's actually people inside the government that are selling this stuff, I've personally had people offer me fake EUCs for a deal. Um, and it, it means that it, even though we have this seemingly legal process and seemingly legal documents, if you've got a $100 million deal going for weapons, they charge up to 5% of the value of the deal because they've got so many people in the government system to pay off that it undermines everything. It undermines the whole process. So I'm going into six minutes now, but what I'm saying in short is that we need a general centralized certificate control process at the, at the headquarters in Addis Ababa which is reportable internationally so that one organization, one international organization develops a registered EUC process with serial numbers, which gets distributed to each country and is controlled under one office worldwide. And if you don't have that particular certificate, uh, then you can't transfer the goods anywhere in the world. So from on a tactical level, I think there needs to be way more circumspectial control rather than giving each individual country control because it opens it up to corruption um and that is that in short is seven minutes <laughs> thank you so much captain gillespie great um so we've sort of moved from a discussion of um sort of the key elements of the political economy of this traffic so who are the actors what do the flows look like what are the motivations of some of those um different actors who are involved all the way up um to um you know, from local to national responses, regional economic community level, and AU level here. Um, so we've had um, a really broad discussion, and I think what I will aspire to do is um, throw out a couple of questions for each of you, Dr. Mubiala and Captain Gillespie, 
and we'll try to do two rounds if we can, since we have about 25 minutes um, till the close. Um, so um, let me um, take a look at what we've got here. Um, so um, there are quite a few interesting questions about data and empirical information that people um, have a thirst for here. So um, uh, we have um, someone asking, do we have numbers or statistics on average on the current movement of these arms across the region? Do we have monitoring units across border posts for um, those which are active on how to reduce arms deals causing fatalities? Um, so I think there are a couple of questions embedded in there, but one that I think it would be useful for us to discuss is, you know, do we have statistics um, and do we have a database on arms deals, um, which we can have access to do further analysis on? And um, I'll throw it out there for both of you to answer, but I also think um, um, I might have an answer to that. So the three of us will tackle that. That's question one. Where, what data and what information that's quantitative do we have about what's happening? Um, a second question, um, a set of questions are about the role of um, foreign actors in the arms trade. Uh, so um, there are quite a few questions about that. Um, an example, um, can any of the speakers comment about the Wagner Group's role in arms trafficking? Um, I'm wondering if um, Captain Gillespie, um, maybe you have some insight on that um, for us. Um, Dr. Mugliala, we also had a similar question about trends that I think you could take. Um, outside of Democratic Republic of Congo, um, which is clearly um, a hub for arms trafficking in Africa, as you've described, what are some other countries across the continent that are um, having similar challenges? So are there Sahelian countries or other countries in the Central African region that need to be considered um, also as transit destination and source countries for arms trafficking. So if you could answer that, that's a little bit about political economy here. Maybe we can start with those and then we have quite a few questions about response. So why don't we do that? I will um, maybe let um, both of you start out. Um, let's start out in terms of data sources. Um, let's let's uh, the, the three of us together sort of um, talk about that. Captain Gillespie, maybe we start with you. Do you have any ideas for folks who want more data that they could go study and analyze for the work that they're doing? Uh, unfortunately, when it comes to the formal sector, we've got plenty of information on who buys what where. All right, there are registers, um, it's well documented, and we know pretty much who the, the top countries sell, what they sell, and where they sell it to. When it comes to the illicit trade, I think we have a very myopic view of what's going on, um, simply because I would say probably 80% of the trade passes us by without us even knowing it. Um, we have no idea of the extent of the illicit arms dealing that's going on, not only in Africa, but in the rest of the world. Um, and it's not only endemic to Africa. If you look at, for example, the, the Mediterranean, every single day, hundreds of fishing vessels leave their ports in Italy and Spain and elsewhere, and like the majority of them do do their business of fishing, but there is a proportion of them that are moving illicit goods across the Mediterranean. Mm -hmm. And we have no insight into that, except occasionally when a naval vessel stops a dhow and finds 2,000 brand new AK-47s on the way to Yemen. Um, but I would say that that is a drop in the ocean. Mm -hmm. So the answer is we do not have enough analysis. And unfortunately, the, the data collectors, like the experts that have been appointed by the United Nations to monitor the embargoed areas um, are just too small to actually get a really real idea of the, the complexity and the, the dynamics that are happening at the moment. Okay, great. Dr. Mubiala, do you have anything to add on this question about data sources or information about flows? Uh, I think, let's say, that Captain Galepsi gave us some good information. It would also be good to consult 
uh, reports, to annual reports that uh, bring up to date the data on illicit trafficking. Uh, Arm survey is, for example, a program uh, out of Geneva that works in collaboration with a certain number of uh, commissions in Africa, such as the Africa Union, uh, they published a very interesting report, and I recommend it to you, which is a, a map of the traffic of uh, illicit light, uh, small arms and light weapons trading. Uh, the survey of small arms and light weapons uh, illicit trade and i think that this is a good report and it presents a number of st statistics of tendencies of the uh, arms trade in africa thank you thank you so much dr mubiala um, Merci beaucoup, Dr. Mubiola. and so i was going to second your um recommendation of looking at the small arms survey if you actually look at the website for this webinar one of the suggested readings um, is a report um, written by some of the people who work for the Small Arms Survey. Um, they do annual sort of um, reports on the state of some of these issues that you all are asking about. They have um, tried to create estimates of global civilian held firearms, globally the number of military owned firearms, and the number of law enforcement owned firearms. So if you um, take a look at what that group is doing. I think that will help for those who are seeking quantitative data and estimates of, of what's going on. I think there is also um, the ENACT, E-N-A-C-T, ENACT, Organized Crime Index, which is, um, it's, it's a group um, that includes Interpol, the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime, and Institute for Security Studies Africa. And every two years, they rank and rate um, through the use of African experts and global experts, every African country on the continent in relation to scope and scale of different forms of trafficking. And so arms trafficking is one of the categories that they track. And so if you want um, some information about um, the scope and scale of that market and then how a particular country um, is doing in terms of potential resilience factors that are in place, either legally, in terms of the security sector, politically. Um, you can take a look at the report and there is information online that will visualize all of these factors and these elements that might be useful to consider. So I would suggest if you take a look at the Africa Center website, you'll be able to access information on our Countering Transnational Organized Crime program page that shows you how to access all of these different sources. And you can always contact us if you would like more help in doing that. We've done past webinars on how to break down the ENACT index um, and to do analysis that's specific to your country or region. So I've seen on the chat, there are quite a few people who have asked questions about specific countries. What's the state of affairs in Benin right now in terms of arms trafficking? What's going on in Nigeria? beyond Republic of Congo, who are some of, what are some of the other countries that are really transit destination and source points for arms flows? And I think these sources might help you use data um, in order to get answers to what you would like. Okay, so now, could I, um, could I ask if um, either of our speakers would like to speak for just a minute or two on the role of the Wagner Group in arms trafficking or the role maybe more broadly of um, uh, uh, you know, non-state actors um, like the Wagner Group, um, uh, private military companies, et cetera, in, in, the role, in their role in all of this. And um, the other question was, um, what other countries beyond DRC on the continent are sort of the key flashpoint countries that we might wanna be thinking about um, you know, uh, when we're talking about arms flows as in terms of transit source and destination countries? No need to be exhaustive. Um, I think Dr. Mubiala's mentioned Mali, uh, Captain Gillespie's mentioned South Sudan. Uh, we talked a lot about DRC, but if there are any other places folks want to underline as a place um, deserving of attention in this domain, please do. So this time, Dr. Mubiala, I'll begin with you. If you would like to answer either or both of those questions in a brief period, please do. Uh, 
Merci beaucoup, Catherine. Je pense Thank que... you so much, Catherine. I think that with regards to countries, we should consider when it comes to illicit traffic. Um, we also have to talk about Chad. A chat is in a particular scenario. You have Darfur, you have also uh, Lake Chad, then you have the north of Libya uh, after the departure of Gaddafi. All of the weapons which were in the country were dispersed. And uh, this is a difficult situation. And so we cannot uh, leave a chat out of all of this, especially after the departure of Gaddafi. And then, unfortunately, we also have uh, the Central African uh, Republic in Car. Unfortunately, what happens in Chad uh, and what happens in South Sudan, because you know there was the border, there is the border between the three countries uh, in the Vantaka area, between uh, Darfur uh, is, and South Sudan, there is this triangle. And um, I think it's better, instead of talking about countries, specific countries, it's better to talk about regions, regions uh, which are targeted by the illicit arms trade. I identified about four regions on which we need to focus in Africa. So you have the Sahel Sahara region, um, around Mali, and then you have, of course, the Chad Lake Basin. Uh, you have Boko Haram in that area and other terrorist uh, groups. And then the other region, which is important, is the Corn of Africa. And I believe that Captain Gillsby already talked to you about the illegal trafficking um, in uh, Somalia, and you have the Corn of Africa. This is a destination for lots of illegal weapons. And, and of course, the region of the Great Lakes. You cannot underestimate this huge region uh, and the epicenter of this region is in the east of Congo, and then you have Burundi, Rwanda, Uganda, Tanzania, and just like my colleague Dr. Gilsby said, and in a certain extent, uh, you know, there are lots of refugees in Kenya. So these are regions, these are spaces which need to be supervised. So I believe that it is better to concentrate on these regions rather than on countries if we want to counter these phenomenons better. Thank you so much. Uh, Captain Gillespie, maybe you can talk to us about the Wagner Group, this, the, the private sector. Um, and what do you think about the non-state actors, the role will they play? Right, so Wagner is a, a PMC, uh, a Russian PMC that has really got itself embroiled in Syrian and African affairs. We have been following Wagner with lots of interest over the last few years because of the political and, and military dynamics that it brings to the table. Um, if you have a look at the involvement of this PMC, which incidentally is illegal in terms of Russian constitutional law, but still somehow exists, they have got involved in the CAR and even managed to get uh, the United Nations 2206 sanctions committee to grant special dispensation to them to train the car security forces and bring in weapons which uh, which was astonishing in the first place uh, we've been following the aircraft the strategic lift aircraft that come from the from russia through to sudan uh, because the the pmc is also involved in sudan in terms of protecting certain individuals, assets, uh, bodyguarding and training. Uh, 
the, the, the transport then goes to the CAR where weapons are delivered and cargo is taken on board. And then it does a round robin back to Russia. So it's a lot of offloading weapons and onloading, we think, uh, rare metals, gold, diamonds, whatever the case is. Um, we can't prove it, obviously. It's not been read, uh, it's not been verified what goes on board, but uh, they are prevalent Sudan CAR. They also pre were prevalent in Mozambique, and they had a contract in Mozambique with the Mozambican government, particularly in the northern area of Mozambique, uh, to deal with the extremists that are operating in the area. They used exactly the same brutal and callous um, uh, uh, tactics they used in Syria, but they came off second best because the locals there do not take nonsense and um, six Wagner members got killed and they were subsequently fired in disgrace and they left the area. They popped up again just recently in South Africa when a cargo vessel came alongside Simonstown a Russian cargo vessel that has been embargoed by the United States, where they allegedly faked distress to come into a naval base, which is very unusual for a cargo vessel. It came alongside for three nights and under the cover of darkness, a whole lot of equipment got dropped off into South Africa and a whole lot of equipment got onboarded over two nights. No one knows what's going on. The newspapers are a buzz about it. The official oppositions asked questions and got no answers. But the rumors have it that the crew were Wagner. And currently, this ship is sitting off Mozambique, awaiting to come alongside into Maputo. Huh. So uh, their activities are quite broad in Africa, extremely dangerous, and have the capacity to create unstable circumstances for those that want to play with them. Sure. So yeah, um, Wagner is an extremely dangerous organization and needs to be watched very carefully. They don't have any rules. They're not governed by the rule of law. They're not subject to accountability and their methods are recorded and are recorded. This is empirical evidence that their methods are um, human rights abuses, war crimes, and criminal acts, uh -huh. in short. Well, thank you, Captain Gillespie, for um, taking that question on. I think we have just enough time with about five to six minutes left. I'll give each of the three of us one more question from the many that people were posing. And I've tried to pick questions that are emblematic of broader patterns and what people are asking. Um, so um, there's one um, that I would like to take on um, first, um, if that's all right. We have someone ask a very interesting question about unintended consequences potentially of arms embargoes. Um, and so the question is, do arms embargoes imposed in conflict zones facilitate the illegal proliferation and manufacture of small arms and light weapons beyond the control of governments and legitimate actors? Um, that's a very interesting question that's sort of thinking about um, policy consequences that may not be intended by some of these embargoes. And I'm sure um, Captain Gillespie probably has thoughts on that and Dr. Mubiala as well. So you can um, please feel free to add if you like. But I wanna draw attention once again to one of the recommended readings that we assigned for this webinar. You can find it on our website. Um, and, and it's about um, making arms embargoes in Africa more effective. And so it's a short piece that the Africa Center uh, researchers um, have written uh, based on their research um, on this. And um, certainly, uh, you know, the, the punchline is arms embargoes can indeed be very effective, but they require regional and international buy-in, yes. adequate monitoring, and the imposition of sufficient costs on the actors who are invading the, san evading the sanctions. Um, and so there's a piece available um, in multiple languages on our website um, that are uh, that's in the recommended readings. So I think that's one place where this person asking this question could go. Um, I think um, certainly probably um, both of our speakers have some idea as well. 
about what they think the answer to that is. Um, certainly one needs to be uh, very thoughtful about um, when you set up, um, you know, whether we're talking about international laws, um, different policies or legislation that's been adopted, ratified, um, you know, how you actually um, implement those kinds of controls is obviously um, a, a big um, challenge um, as well. So thinking about how to do that well, we have a little bit of reading on that that we um, have shared with you and our experts may weigh in. Um, in the meantime, I have one question for Captain Gillespie and one for Dr. Mubiala. So for Captain Gillespie, um, we got a question, um, where is it, about Ukraine. Um, do we think, given what is going on in Ukraine, that there are new risks for influxes of sophisticated arms um, coming from that conflict into um, onto the African continent? Um, and then um, another question, uh, for Dr. Mubiala, um, there is a question about, um, you know, uh, border control um, and urban criminality. So um, what is the impact of arms trafficking on urban criminality? Um, what do we know about the countries most affected by that? Or if you want to speak about that in the DRC as an example, maybe that's helpful. Um, so let me go to each of you for just about two minutes. I know that that doesn't do justice to what you might have as answers to your questions or to the one that was asked about unintended consequences, but give us your quick takes. Um, let me go first to Captain Gillespie. Right, Ukraine. Um, in terms of international law, Ukraine is a, a sovereign country, a recognized member of the Security Council, a, a recognized member of the United Nations and it was invaded by a member of the Security Council. Uh, generally speaking, uh, there are no embargoes, there's no embargoes against Ukraine in, 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 the, in executing its international law right of self-defense. Um, and I don't believe that when the war is over and whatever outcome there is, that that surplus of, of, of weapons will find its way back to Africa because there are more than enough weapons in, in Africa in terms of surplus stock to keep us busy for decades to come. An AK-47 that was made in 1956 and wrapped up in Greece and put into a box has a lifespan of 500 years, and it won't break until such time as you start using it. So we have enough problems without worrying about Ukraine. Um, uh, there was a question on, on uh, criminality and crime syndicates. And it is indeed a major problem because syndicates, particularly where I live in South Africa, are incredibly well armed. We've got the cash and transit problems. We've got cable thefts. We've got syndicates that are protecting um, their, their patch incredibly well armed. We know that weapons are coming in through Mozambique into South Africa. We also know that weapons are coming through Namibia into South Africa and going to the gangs in Cape Town and other areas. So um, illegal arms proliferation within the criminal syndicates does create major problems because it has a massive effect on the community and particularly women. And if you do an analysis on how weapons, illegal weapons affect communities, um, men with guns are very dangerous because they take what they want and they abuse and they carry on and it has massive effect on the family unit, particularly the woman because their husbands get killed or injured and they end up having to hold up the family. They get abused, they get raped, they get robbed. So there is this massive impact on uh, illegal arms and the criminal community and the local community, yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, let us turn to Dr. Mubiala for the last words. Um, if you would like to um, address um, uh, these questions, um, the question about urban criminality um, or about um, unintended consequences of arms embargoes or anything else, please, you have a couple of minutes here before we wrap up. Yes. Uh... If you take the example like of the DRC, you have more than 100 armed groups, not only locally uh, armed groups, but also foreign. For example, there is an influence in the supply 
the, the uh, of, of bandits and gangs uh, and in the urban zones from foreign entities, but we cannot overestimate or underestimate the arms that come on the local level that are um, making their own arms, uh, maybe crafting their own arms. Perhaps they're not very efficient, but still they can lead to uh, killings and to um, and to theft. And this is a, a problem that we have in DRC. There is a large influence of these armed groups, especially on the, the border areas that allow this uh, transfer of arms from one country to another. And uh, especially in the eastern part of the DRC, and in Kinshasa, we often see uh, knives or machetes, other types of arms also. But sometimes with the complicity of the police and armed people from the armed forces, they sell the part of the stock, national stock of arms. There are arms that are stolen and that are uh, sold on the side. So there's that aspect as well that contributes to urban crime. crime. Thank you. So I, I think sadly, there's so many other questions and there's so many other angles of this complex subject that we could continue to discuss, but we are out of time today. I wanna thank everyone uh, who joined us today for coming, uh, for posing your questions. Um, if you have follow-up, for us on this issue. We're um, very much open to your thoughts about this. Um, um, if there are things that you think the Africa Center um, can be doing to support uh, various efforts that all of you are engaged in um, to counter uh, small arms and light weapons trafficking, we'd be very interested to know what you're doing in this domain. Um, thank you to both of our really distinguished panelists who are experts uh, in this domain and they gave us um, their, their precious time. Uh, to share some of their experiences and to talk about this. And um, I think we've seen um, sort of uh, the political economy of this, um, new data sources that we've pasted into the chat as well. Those data sources that we mentioned have all been pasted into the chat. We can help you find them. Or if you go to the website, the recommended readings and the Countering Transnational Organized Crime Program page has lots of information and lots of videos um, from the past work we've done um, about empirical data sources that can help you track tendencies in your country and your region or on a particular form of crime like arms trafficking. And then of course, we discussed important African Union level, regional level frameworks, and then the importance of local community dynamics in fashioning policy responses, as well as national level um, coordination uh, between security and justice, but also um, legislation and, and the role that that plays. Um, but that is the only, only the beginning, as we heard from Captain Gillespie and Dr. Mubiala. There's a lot that goes into implementation of embargoes or other policy responses that um, we should also keep in mind. So I hope this helped expand your understanding. Uh, uh, we have a big community interested in this area. So please keep in touch with us. And if we can do anything to help, uh, we look forward to hearing from you. So over and out to everybody and have a nice evening. Thank you very much.